Welcome back to The Explanation Pro. Today I'll recap a horror film called, Bone Snatcher. Spoilers incoming. The movie begins with a group of archaeologists exploring the vast Namib desert of Africa. A barrage of explosions occurs, and the archaeologist's seismograph records the disturbance in the ground. The team then discuss the possible appearance of a volcanic pipe. But another member argues that there are no volcanoes in the area, meaning that a volcanic pipe is not likely, which also means, there are no diamonds. The seismograph wasn't making any sense, so the trio decided to check on the location of the explosion. As they near the site, they come across some sort of tribal totem made of sticks and bones. The trio stops for a second to observe the bizarre scene and then goes to the site. Later, they arrive at the explosion site and see a large lump of sandstone. The formation of the lump is peculiar since it doesn't usually occur in the desert. One of the archaeologists grabs his small pickaxe and hits the sandstone to grab a sample. He ends up creating a hole and takes a closer look when suddenly, a mysterious being pulls the man as he screams in terror. Dr. Zack receives a warning of the temperature dropping at a lab due to system failure in the Antarctica module. A colleague works on a solution fast, or else the crew on Antarctica would freeze to death. With a few seconds left, Dr. Zack gambles and orders Mel to override the system, and just in time, the system stabilizes, and the temperature goes up, saving the crew. Their boss then approaches them, hands Zack a plane ticket, and informs Zack that there's a different site looking for a system analyst. Later, a taxi drops Dr. Zack in the middle of nowhere and drives away. The doctor sees a local selling different strange materials. With not much option, Zack asks if the man has something to help with the headache. To his surprise, the local hands him a Tylenol, extra strong. Just what he needed after a long journey. Then, a truck arrives, the driver greets the doctor and signals to get in the truck. Soon after, they reach a gated facility of Eland, a mining company based in the African desert. Zack enters a station to check in with security and meets Mickey and a much older male. The welcome was not as warm as the weather. After a while, two men named Carl and Titus enter the room. She begins inspecting through his luggage when she notices a strange device which the doc named Charlie. It's a subterranean analyzer whose primary function is to find water up to a hundred feet deep. While Mikey looks for a journal, the older male colleague inserts the journal into his pants and calls Mikey's attention, inappropriately teasing her. Carl tells the old perv to hand over the journal. Then, the old man takes a lousy swing at Carl, to which he evades easily. In retaliation, Carl grabs the old man and headbutts him unconscious, ending the brawl. After the commotion, the doc gets notified that a group of prospectors got themselves lost, and they'll try to find them along the way. Mikey, Dr. Zack, and Carl are joined by Titus, Kurt, and Magda, bringing their own weapons. When the doctor asks what's up with all the firepower, Carl explains that it's for the rebels who try to attack them, thinking they have diamonds. They traverse through the harsh desert in search of their missing colleagues, and after hours of searching, Mikey spots a truck. They take a closer look and find two of their co-workers' corpses. Carl suspects that the third man missing might have been the murderer. Titus signals to the others that he found something. When they run up to Titus' position, they see footprints and track the suspected killer on foot. After a few moments, Titus takes a brief stop and tells Carl that when they first started following the tracks, it had two feet but suddenly, it's four. Indicating that it started out bipedal, and later, somehow, it was walking in all fours like some dog. They soon arrive at a desolate place with bizarre otherworldly totems. Zack tries to touch the figure on the stick, but Titus taps his shoulders, stops him, and tells him that it's a warning sign. Then, Titus tells everyone to move out. The team follows the tracks until they spot a skull and later a body. Kurt takes a closer look at the carcass and bones. He then recalls that Harvey had a motorcycle incident causing him to limp. Kurt and Mikey think that the corpse could be Harvey since one of the bones has a metal plating indicating that he had surgery. On the other hand, Carl doesn't believe it's Harvey's corpse and insists he's still on the run. Magda tells Carl to stop with the chase and deliver the fuel to sea camp as ordered. During nightfall, the crew is deep asleep except Zack. He couldn't sleep, and recalling how he ended up in the middle of nowhere wasn't helping. So to keep himself sane, he goes sand surfing in the middle of the night. After losing his balance, his heart jumps when Mikey taps him on his shoulders and tells him that the noise he was making and Charlie's constant beeping kept her awake. 
She then sits beside Zach and hugs him for body warmth. After a brief exchange, Mikey goes back to the truck. Then the device gauge flares up. When Zach looks to his side, he sees a tall and horrific entity. He runs to the car and wakes up everybody. The doctor explains what he saw, and Mikey notices the corpse missing. Carl suspects Zach and begins questioning him where the corpse is. Zach argues that it wasn't him. Titus, on the other hand, whispers Tokolosh. When asked, Titus explains that Esikulu, the Sand Mother takes every life to sustain herself and live forever. Not only that, the Sand Mother has the capabilities to turn everybody against themselves, simply breaking them apart. The following morning, they catch up, and when Kurt looks at his scoped rifle, he sees an ungodly bipedal humanoid. It was almost shadow-like. Carl takes the sniper from Kurt and locks the scope through the entity that killed their friends. He then pulls the trigger and hits it. As it hits the monster, it disintegrates. The team goes over only to find bones. Not one soul can explain what it was except Titus. He shares that when he was a boy, something similar occurred. A shepherd boy wandered off, and the next thing they found, his skull picked clean. Bones that walk and disappear flesh, they call it Esikulu. And just when you think the situation couldn't get worse, the truck breaks down when Magda tries to turn it on. To put the icing on the cake, they couldn't contact any headquarter with their radio. They can only hear static noises coming out of the radio. With not much option, they use the emergency beacon. After a few days, a plane passes by. Zack panics as it passes by while everybody else stays calm. Magda tells the doctor to calm down since they're pretty sure that it spotted them and it will send a truck to rescue them after a day or two. Later, Magda inflates an emergency tent and hands out supplies. On the other hand, Kurt collects the bones and puts them in storage in the truck. He also manages to get the lights working. Deep into the night, Kurt wakes up Titus, stating that it was his turn to keep watch. He then grabs a sleeping bag and goes to sleep while Titus sits on a rock keeping an eye out for everyone during that evening. Then Titus hears something and freaks out. He tries to wake up Kurt, and when he isn't budging, he opens the sleeping bag only to find Kurt shivering and the skin of his face ripped off. Titus screams out for Carl and tries to pull his arm off the grip of the Esikulu. Carl reacts quickly by shooting at the black sand-like particles approaching him. Meanwhile, Zack and the others carry Titus into the truck. Soon, Carl realizes that shooting at it with bullets doesn't work, and so, he grabs a fuel can and pours gasoline at the Esikulu. He then climbs up the truck and grabs his Zippo lighter. Magda pointed a gun at Carl when he was about to ignite the gas to stop him. Remember, they have thousands of liters of fuel on top of the truck, and the flames might burn them to crisp. Zack stops them by telling them that the Esikulu turning away. Magda and Mikey tend to Titus' wounds. He lost a lot of blood, and to save him, he needs to be at the hospital. Subsequently, Zack notices the device picking up something. And so, he goes down the truck to pour fuel on the sand, thinking it might repel the monster away. When he looks up, he sees Carl pointing the sniper in his direction and tells him to move. Unbeknownst to Zack, the Esikulu is right behind him, and Carl is trying to shoot at it, only he's on the way. When Zack turns around, he sees the terrifying figure of the monster, Esikulu. Carl has a clear shot and takes it. The monster disintegrates but tries to take form again. Carl runs over to Zack's side and chambers one in. Zack notices that instead of going after them, the Esikulu is walking away. Fearing that it might come back or get angry at them, he tries to stop Carl from shooting at it. Carl fights back and tackles the doctor to the ground. Carl delivers one blow at the doctor. Before he can do a second, Mikey points a gun at the hot-headed Carl stopping him. She yells at them that to survive, they must work together. Given Titus's condition, time is of the essence. Carl suggests carrying Titus to the nearest outpost about 40 kilometers away at first light. Magda protested since moving a large man across the desert heat in almost a marathon in distance. Magda suggests leaving Titus with her in the truck as they look for rescue. Titus tries hard to voice out that the Sand Mother or Esikulu is looking for its children. Zack, Carl, and Mikey hike the desolate and waterless wilderness the following day. Nothing but sand as far as the eyes can see and the scourging sun up in the sky. The doctor starts hearing things, but he steals himself and moves along. Later, Zack reads from one direction, and they walk towards it until the reading gets stronger. 
The doctor explains to the two that his device finds water and checks if it's safe to drink by determining its acidity. And right now, the scales are off the roof, it scans the ants. Suddenly, the wind picks up. They see a sandstorm fast approaching from a distance, and they grab each other tightly. After the storm passes, they dig themselves out of the sand and find the fuel can almost empty and the device destroyed. Later that night, they find a place to rest. Zack pours gasoline on the sand and circles around to keep the Esikulu from approaching. They take a rest at a dead tree with their backs against each other. Then Carl turns on his flashlight and spots the Esikulu slowly approaching them. As it faces Zack and the others, they see that the monster has taken Magda's face and worn it. It tried to approach them but couldn't due to the gasoline poured on the sand. The next day, the trio wakes up from radio transmission. Carl figures that it's the prospector's truck then head towards it. They discover the truck as well as the sandstone lump. The same sandstone lump that was forced open at the start. Zack jumps in and analyzes the formation inside. He explains that Esikulu is actually made of ants and that to manipulate and take the form of a humanoid, it uses human bones for its survival. Johan arrives on the site to investigate the murder, but instead, he arrives and tells the crew to get out of the hole. He suspects that the trio is responsible for the death of the prospectors and others. The motive? Diamonds. Johan thinks that they killed the others for diamonds. The trio tries to explain what really happened, but the stubborn old man wasn't having it. The three manages to escape before Johan can take them to prison. They agreed to stop the Esikulu and figured it was looking for a nest to start a new colony. And they deducted that the best place for it to make a nest is in the old mine. Later they arrive at the old mine and hunt for the dreadful creature. Soon, it emerges from the shadows, and they start shooting at it. Carl loses his balance, and before the Esikulu can kill Carl, Zack fires his gun up in the air. The Esikulu runs towards Zack, but the doctor has something in store for the vile monster. He steps aside, and the Esikulu falls into the deep hole with the momentum. Carl and Mikey catch up to Zack. Carl compliments Zack for eliminating the fiend, but suddenly, the Esikulu grabs into Carl's leg. They were dead wrong in thinking that they'd killed the Esikulu. Mikey and Zack try to pull Carl back up but knowing that there's not much choice, Carl pulls out a nitroglycerin and sacrifices himself. Mikey and Zack find the controlling organism and stabs it to death, then run out of the mine just in time before it collapses. The movie ends with Mikey and Zack bidding farewell to each other. The doctor helps Mikey with her luggage into the taxi. Unbeknownst to them, part of the Esikulu survives and is in the crate with Mikey. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video please hit the like button and also subscribe my channel for more videos like this. See you in the next video.